Um, so my name is John Lutz, I'm chair of the history department, and I just wanted to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional territory of the Songhees and the Squamish peoples. And uh, to say a little bit uh, about uh, the Global South Colloquium, of which this land is down lecture forms uh, a part, and uh, then introduce my colleague uh, who will introduce our guest speaker today. So just to say briefly, uh, uh, again, welcome to all of you, also on behalf of the history department. Um, the Lansdowne Lecture Series is a series that brings in uh, distinguished scholars uh, uh, from around the globe to talk to us about um, items of great interest in the court. Um, and, but uh, Neelish Bose, Dr. Neelish Bose, who joined the department a year ago, has um, initiated a Global South Colloquium on which this uh, Lansdowne Lecture uh, has become a part uh, of. And uh, I think that the idea of Dr. Bose is that um, um, we have lots of opportunity here at the University of Victoria to become a Canadian, maybe North American Center for discussion of global South issues. And what better way to bring in scholars like Professor Moyne and others? I think this is the third, third in the series, and we're expecting this year two more, two more in the series, which uh, I think Dr. Bose will tell you about probably sometime in the course of the evening. Um, uh, to really uh, raise our game at UVic, and uh, as you, many of you will know, uh, in addition to the uh, lecture that uh, Dr. Moyne is giving uh, today, he's giving a seminar tomorrow uh, for people who really want to engage with him in person and dive in. So without saying any more, I'd like you to welcome uh, our relatively new colleague, I guess I guess he gets less new every year, but uh, I'm Dr. Moyne's folks. Thank you very much. Uh... John, for the introduction, and I'd like to also welcome you here for the Lansdowne Lecture in uh, the Department of History in 2017 here at the University of Victoria. As John mentioned, this is also uh, a part of the Global South Colloquium, the third lecture in that series, which is a forum for intellectual exploration on the history and politics of globalization. Um, the colloquium takes as its title the Global South, which traditionally refers to post-colonial regions uh, like South Asia. Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. But this series is not only a geographical orientation to an area that uh, was once called the non-West, or would still be called the non-West, but a provocation to orient discussions about the world system and its contours and its sources of power and inequity. And so the focus is not so much on geography, but questions about global history, which uh, Professor Moon's talk will uh, definitively um, in a sense, uh, bring about. Each year, this colloquium uh, uh, will host four to six scholars of international reputation speaking to aspects of this year's thematic focus. The focus for this year is religion and globalization. And uh, earlier scholars in the series have included uh, Professor Niall Green from UCLA, Professor uh, Srinivas from UC Davis, um, today with Professor Moyne, um, Dr. Mindy Fernando, who is coming in two weeks' time to speak about Islam and secularism in France, and Dr. Susanna Hachel, who will speak about Judaism and Islam in the 19th century. Um, now, one might suspect that uh, a discussion of Christian human rights, as is mentioned here in the title, does not explore the global south as such. Um, this discussion will bring about a critical history of human rights, which uh, offers for us implications about understanding the nature of power and the nature of global transformations in the 20th century. Uh, and so may lead to uh, a reframing of what we often take for granted um, in the history of human rights. So before introducing Dr. Moyne's uh, scholarship and research interests, I'd like to thank uh, a variety of individuals and units who have assisted in making this event happen and uh, Dr. Moyne's visit a uh, possibility, including uh, the chair of the history department, uh, John Lutz, uh, um, also the faculty of humanities, the Center for Studies in Religion and Society, the uh, Center for Global Studies, the Department of Anthropology, the Center for Asia-Pacific Initiatives, and the Cultural, Social, and Political Thought Program, as well as students who have been um, with me in this colloquium, including Marta Bashovsky, Diana Cordero, Adam Kostrich, Caitlin Findlay, Vikram Gill, and Joel Lagasse. So Dr. Moyne uh, is Jeremiah Smith, Jr. Professor of Law and Professor of History at Harvard University. Um, he previously had taught for 13 years in Columbia University's Department of History, um, where he was also uh, James Bryce Professor of European Legal History. Uh, Dr. Moyne has written several books in his fields of European intellectual history and human rights history, in the latter genre, Human Rights and the Uses of History, 2014, 
uh, perhaps his most uh, well-known, The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, 2010, and the book upon which tonight's talk is based, Christian Human Rights in 2015, as well as the notable co-edited collection, Global Intellectual History, 2013. Within the field of European history, he has published Origins of the Other, Emmanuel Levinas Between Revelation and Ethics in 2006, and A Holocaust Controversy, The Treblinka Affair in Post-War France in 2005. His areas in legal scholarship include international law, human rights studies, the law of war, and legal thought. His title, uh, as seen here, is Christian Human Rights. So without any further uh, ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Samuel Morgan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, above all, to Professor Bose for uh, single-handedly organizing this uh, session. And thanks to you all for coming. Uh, so uh, at, at Professor Bose's request, I'm going to speak about this most recent book that I published called Christian Human Rights. And it is a very specific story, a story about how some Christians at a very particular moment and place uh, helped vault some ideas that have gone global uh, to their prominence. Now, this story, uh, I thought, had one moral, but recently I've been flirting with a second moral that this story should have. Uh, you know, the past always changes, or actually that's not true, but uh, an old philosopher tells us that all history is contemporary history. Uh, and that's because we always look at the past, even if it's static from our own particular point of view. And in my country, uh, the past uh, has just changed a lot because the present has changed a lot, or, or as Donald Trump might put it, bigly. Uh, and uh, really this new moral that I wanna offer you about what the history of Christian human rights might tell us now is, is a reflection uh, uh, on, on these most recent events. So I do want to start out with that day after Donald Trump was elected uh, in my country. Uh, and a very interesting note of congratulations that the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, uh, sent him. Uh, it was a note of warning, uh, and yet it was from a fellow conservative. Uh, she is... Uh, the leader of the Christian Democratic Party in Germany, uh, and yet she faces her own challenge uh, from the right, a challenge that we now today call populist challenge uh, from a party called Alternative for Germany. And it was, I think, with that challenge in mind that she offered this warning to the American populist politician Donald Trump, saying that there's been this transatlantic bond, and one of its sources, not the only one on the list, but one of the sources, is the idea of the dignity of man. That's actually what this lecture is going to be about. How did it become possible for a conservative to warn a conservative populist that the dignity of man has to be respected. Well, this wasn't a new idea, actually, for Merkel. Going back a year, uh, she gave a very um, remark speech in Germany at the, her uh, party's congress, this Christian Democratic Party's Parteitag, where they meet annually. And she was under fire because her comparative generosity in welcoming refugees uh, from Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East was not only something that caused strife within her party, it was giving a lot of new support to this populist alternative for Germany that has been rising. And Merkel had to defend herself. And once again, she relied on this principle the dignity of man. Uh, and she said that our party, the Christian Democratic Party, the CDU, was founded on it. Not only 
the dignity of man, but the God-given dignity of man. Uh, Now, you might say the idea of dignity is for anyone to invoke. And I think now that's true. Uh, It can be used to support so many things. It might have many sources. That's what I want to investigate. But actually, I think Merkel is quite authentic in her appeal to human dignity. It was at the origins of her party, the Christian Democratic Party in Germany. And as I want to show you in this lecture, it originated as an important political principle in European history as a bulwark against populism. And it's for that reason that she's invoking it against Trump today. So I want to take you on a kind of detective story where we try to figure out where this concept of human dignity came from, uh, what some alternative possibilities are, and how it is that even today it could be invoked by someone like Merkel as a Christian principle that will save conservatives like her and her party from populists whom they fear. So I'm going to start my detective story uh, with what I hope will be a point that's uncontroversial, because I think it is. I'm going to start with a pontiff, a Roman Catholic pope in the middle of World War II in 1942, uh, this is Pius XII, who uh, uh, gave a Christmas message that and and every year. Uh, And in 1942, it was a pregnant moment for him to do so. Uh, It was not clear to him who would win the war. There were Catholics and Christians on both sides of it. He was almost a prisoner in his own Roman domain. He didn't mention it in his Christmas message, but the Jews had already died in large numbers. Stalingrad was about to end, and the tide was to turn. And he vaulted this idea of human dignity at this moment more than I think any actor ever had before in history to the pinnacle of world political rhetoric. He offered five peace points, and the very first of them was that the peace would have to be based on the dignity of the human person. And indeed, that this dignity is the reason why humans have rights, certain, as he says, in this first peace point, fundamental personal rights. He even alludes later to the unforgettable rights of man. Now, the reason I want to take this as a starting point is that I think there's no doubt that this was a prominent statement, and I think there's little doubt that it was the most prominent invocation of this idea of human dignity up to that date in human history. At least I can't find an earlier politician or political figure or religious figure uh, who invokes it as an important principle. Certainly no pope ever had. And the interesting thing is that not only had no pope ever invoked human dignity, but never had popes embraced human rights in this way. As you might know, in the 19th century, Roman Catholic popes in particular had tried not to remember the unforgettable rights of man, but to forget them because they were associated with the French Revolution, with all it had meant for uh, the conflict between the secular and the religious in Europe. But this was also a pivotal moment, let's say, from the reverse direction. There had been many invocations of human rights, most again associated with the French Revolution. 
but never had dignity, human dignity, been said to lay at the foundation of those rights. There had been rights in Virginia and the United States uh, at the very beginning of the American Revolution and in the, the American Declaration of Independence later that summer, but no appeal to human dignity. In the French Revolution, same answer. I find very little usage of the concept of human dignity in the 19th century. And so this is an interesting moment. And it's interesting not least because of what will follow from it. The United Nations Charter, three years later, will begin with the claim that all humans are free and equal in dignity and rights. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights will follow six years later with the same language. I think there's no doubt that if we're looking for the immediate precedence to those central human rights documents, we have to give credit to Pius XII. But then we have to ask, what did he mean? Where did he get the idea? Did whatever he meant by human dignity accompany human rights as they entered into the United Nations Charter and eventually the Universal Declaration and all the human rights movements we've seen since? Those are the questions I want to answer. Now, in doing so, I'm going to disagree with some others who have talked a lot about where dignity might have come from. Just recently, there's a big historical debate about this, and this is one answer I'm giving, surely not the only one. One view is that the idea of human dignity is really old. It comes from the Bible. It comes maybe specifically from Genesis 1, 26, 7, which says that humans are made in the image and likeness of God. Now, I don't just want to us say that there's no word dignity that we can use to translate any biblical term. I think there's a more important point, which is that even if the Bible suggests that humans are special in the order of creation, such different consequences have been drawn over the millennia from that background notion. It would be hard to think that the Bible is the source of the various human rights we consider central, since the Bible tells us to violate most of them. And so if human dignity originates in the Bible, it seems like we have to conclude that it changed in its meaning so drastically at some point to become the foundation for the human rights we acknowledge today and that we embrace. Now, the word dignity comes from Latin, uh, and it means a rank. And this meaning has led another group to claim that it's a very old concept, but it has a more secular origin. On this theory of human dignity, there were once aristocrats of high rank and the word dignity referred to their rank. It distinguished some people from others. And somehow that high rank was generalized to all human beings. This is like a democratization thesis. Now that might have happened. It's a social history. But it's hard to account for the facts I'm going to share with you about how the concept of human dignity entered our political language at a very specific moment, not over the centuries, but in the 1930s and 40s, and at the hands of very specific actors, Christians in general and Roman Catholics in particular. Uh, now, even if I prove that to your satisfaction, we still want to ask, what did it mean in the later 40s, in 1948 in particular? And for us today, when we invoke the concept, if we're part of human rights movements, I'll get there. Okay, so what I want to do is uh, move back now.
to understand Pius XII in 1942, we can't start in 1942. We have to go further back. And that's important. Many people will say that human dignity must have been a response to the Holocaust. That's why it's found in the first article of the West German Constitution in 1949. But in fact, the first constitution to feature an appeal to human dignity occurred 12 years before that in Ireland in 1937. And I want to look at this person, uh, the uh, leading politician of Ireland at the time, Eamon de Valera, and this moment, Ireland 1937, because I think we can see this invocation of dignity as, as maybe the most helpful one to understand its trajectory in this crucial transwar period. It was an incredibly interesting moment in West European history and Christian history. It looked like democracy was failing in economic crisis, much like the one we've had lately, except it was far worse. And it was so bad that the populism they saw back then swamped many, in fact, most European democracies. There had been constitutions all across Europe after World War I, all liberal and secular, all listed most of the human rights we know today, including so-called social rights, economic rights at times, none mentioned human dignity or said that the rights came from human dignity. And then populism came. And Christians in particular faced a very hard choice. In places like Italy and Germany, they had to decide whether to embrace secular populism. But there were also Christian populisms, attempts to found Christian states on the ruins of liberal democracy. Probably the most exciting for Catholics was in Austria, which between 1934 and 1938 was an authoritarian Catholic state. Uh, but you probably will also have heard of uh, Portugal uh, and Spain. And then there was World War II when there were many of Hitler's satellite states that were explicitly religious in their leadership or in their ideology. Some of these states in the 30s and 40s enacted constitutions. Uh, these didn't mention dignity, the dignity of man either when uh, there were constitutions as there were in Austria and Portugal, not Spain. De Valera in Ireland did not want to scuttle liberal democracy. He was a conservative, he was a Christian, but he was not a populist in the same way. He wanted to scuttle the liberal constitution that Ireland first got after World War I and independence and its struggle for freedom for various reasons. But he didn't want to replace liberal democracy, so he invented something new in 1937, Christian democracy. It was more conservative than what came before. It made much more room for religious precept uh, in the Constitution and in public life than came before. And it was the first Constitution ever to appeal to the concept of human dignity in a very prominent way. Now, it wasn't terribly prominent. You can see from this preamble just how Christian this preamble was uh, on the ruins of the secular constitution that had preceded it. But also that dignity is there, the dignity uh, and freedom of the individual. Now, I'm proposing we interpret this as uh, uh, almost an accident. Uh, de Valera was writing his constitution, wanting to make it more conservative, more Christian, and because of the Christian political thought of the moment, his handiwork 
encoded this new idea that was beginning to spread, human dignity. Now, concretely, De Valera, as I said, did not want to scuttle liberal democracy. He did want to strip the vote from women that women had gotten in the first constitution, but he wasn't successful there. He did write several articles when it came to marriage, the place of the church and property that directly incorporated Christian social thought. And yet without going all the way to a reactionary politics as was happening practically everywhere else in Europe. So like Merkel today, it's a conservative politics that is, is stopping short of even taking dignity to be the bulwark against a populism that seems to be on the rise. Now, why, why dignity? It's just a word. Well, the theory I've come up with is that it's a moment for Catholics in general when populism uh, seems like a mistake. And we find good evidence for that in papal rhetoric, even before Pius XII. It's not as prominent as in his Christian message, Christmas message that I showed you from 1942, but it's percolating. Popes like Pius XI, the immediate predecessor of Pius XII, had at times welcome populism. They'd made pacts with Mussolini and for that matter, Hitler uh, in their treaties. Uh, and of course, many Catholics sided with those regimes, many Italian uh, and German Catholics uh, and Christians generally. And on the continent in general, these were much admired figures. And yet the church was finding that they were wayward bargains. Their alliances with secular dictators didn't always work out in their favor. And in the same month that de Valera wrote his new constitution, Pius XI, that's the prior pope to Pius XII, issued two encyclicals, both of which drew a line between Christianity and populism. One to the left, condemning atheistic communism. One to the right, protesting Hitler's trampling of church rights. Both of these encyclicals issued in March 1937 and the anti-communist one is all about human dignity. It's from this point uh, that uh, central to Catholic thought is that communism goes wrong because it doesn't give room to the individual and respect his or her dignity. And you can see some examples of that language on the slide. More generally, the suggestion is Catholics are taking dignity as a marker for conservatives who want to have a shield against going too far in an illiberal populist direction. Now, I don't have a smoking gun that these encyclicals, and especially the anti-communist one, directly influenced de Valera. Uh, all I have is circumstantial evidence. And here it is that uh, so far as we can tell, uh, the concept of human dignity enters the Constitution after and presumably in response to the issuing of these encyclicals. And yet I don't want to put too much emphasis on the Constitution as much as on the moment that it registers, sort of like a tape recorder that was on. Because Catholics, after having, uh, let's say, begun to learn some lessons about what happens when you throw in your lot with populism, began to speak about dignity more and more and began to take their distance more and more from illiberal regimes. 
you see some evidence of this. And from what I can tell, um, in the midst of World War II, when Catholics explained why they were opposing Hitler, they were, mo they were the ones most apt to um, defend themselves, defend their position in terms of human dignity. So one example comes from this Jesuit uh, at Georgetown University who says the conflict is between two sides, one of which stands for the rights of the individual uh, endowed with the dignity of the human personality, and on the other, all the populace of the world. Now, uh, this is sometimes scary for people who think that the first constitution to make a big deal of dignity was only in 1949 uh, in West Germany, because actually the first constitution to make dignity its first article was in the Vichy years in France. Now, Vichy was the government of unoccupied France. It was led by Marshal Philippe Pétain after the Germans conquered the French in 1940. And it was deeply influenced by a Christian morality. It claimed to be enacting it, much like the authoritarians of Spain and Portugal. And yet, in 1944, Vichy offered a constitution. Uh, it never was enacted that started with the first principle of human dignity, individual human dignity. Even as the state was deporting Jews uh, to the Holocaust. How do we explain this? Well, I've told a story in which de Valera in 1937 is taking a secular republic and moving it to the right. If you like, Pétain was doing the reverse. When he started his constitution making, the leader, the authoritarian Christian leader of France, uh, modeled his constitution on that of Portugal. But then it became increasingly clear that the Americans were going to win the war, and Pétain hoped to survive. So without giving up his authoritarian rule, he offered a more liberal constitution in 1944. And it's very interesting that he, in a way, reached de Valera's point from the opposite direction, moving from um, outright authoritarianism to a constitution that embraces the dignity of the individual. Now, we also have other data. This is from Google Ngram which allows us to test how much people say stuff in various languages that show that this formula, the dignity of the human person, is on the rise not after the Holocaust, not in response to it, really had nothing to do with the Jews or the barbarity of World War II at all. Uh, it had to do with finding a Christian political option in between secular liberalism uh, and uh, illiberal populism. And so you can see in English that this formula is on the rise in the mid-30s. This is the formula that will appear in the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration. Other more familialist formulae are, are, have, have a big boost. This is in French uh, in uh, the midst of World War II. But because Pétain was wrong and Vichy does not survive, that sort of politics doesn't either. And you can see it falls in the 40s. Now, there were some important publicists for this idea in the midst of World War II. And easily the leading one was a philosopher named Jacques Maritain. And he's so useful to us in our inquiry because He's quite insistent that this new idea of human dignity will allow us to save human rights from the secularists and the liberals with which that idea had been so closely associated since the French Revolution. He says, human rights, we can't have them anymore without God, without dignity. 
but if we attach them to and ground them firmly on this notion of the dignity of the human person, we can reclaim them for the sake of Christianity and indeed for the sake of conservatism. We get that in a big way two years uh, after that first Christmas message I showed you. Now in Christmas 1944, Pius XII speaks again. It's clear to him and to everyone who is going to win the war. Hadn't been so two years before. It's clear that there's going to be some kind of liberal democracy triumphant. The Americans are going to win. And yet for him too, it's crucial to distinguish between its bad, materialist, liberal, secular form and its good, Christian, conservative, spiritual form. And once again, dignity is the word that he uses to mark the difference. One of his most interesting claims in this Christmas message is as follows. The story of Christmas teaches us about the inviolable dignity of man even more with an authority that transcends any possible declaration of rights. So this is quite interesting because even though dignity is the source of rights, dignity also functions to keep rights in check so that they don't get out of hand, so that the wrong people don't use and abuse them. So that's my story about the origins of human dignity. But I told you we couldn't be done until we find out whether in the 40s or in our time the same meaning attaches to the concept. Well, our first port of call in this regard has to be the UN Charter in 1945. These are photos I took from my iPhone uh, of uh, the papers of the person who wrote or more exactly revised the preamble of the UN Charter at San Francisco when uh, the uh, powers of the world met to create the United Nations. Actually, it was a South African uh, politician uh, named Jan Christian Smuts who wrote the first draft of the preamble of the United Nations uh, Charter. It did not mention dignity. And then the dean of Barnard College, a uh, named Virginia Gildersleeve, wrote it in. That's quite interesting. I don't know how well you can see it. Uh, but it originally said sanctity and ultimate value of human personality. And she, you can see, crossed that out and wrote in dignity and worth, which is what it says today. Now, it's interesting. If she hadn't done that, maybe we would have had a lecture about something else. Maybe there'd be a historical dispute today about the origins of the idea of the sanctity of the human being, except that I think that idea is much older. It's quite interesting that she chose to write this in. I don't know why no one does to date. Uh, there's no evidence that explains why she did this, and yet it was fateful because from this point on, dignity is going to be very closely associated, not just for Christians, but for the whole world with the idea of human rights. Now, there's a great political theorist named Charles Bites at Princeton who says, you might be right about Pius XII and about who's using the concept of human dignity in the 30s and during the 40s in wartime. But as of the UN Charter, it's anyone's word. And the fact that it was so uncontroversial must mean that it had already lost any real significance. It was just a buzzword. Well, maybe. I don't think that can be totally right if we descend from the level of these international documents to the level of constitutions, because every constitution, and there are about eight 
that begin with human dignity uh, in this era are West European Christian countries. And they're introduced by Christian Democrats who are taking power in Western Europe. There's only one exception to this uh, that I know of, which is in South Korea, a short-lived South Korean constitution. The first of these is already in 1946, when in the state of Bavaria, uh, the Catholic uh, state of Bavaria, uh, a part of Germany, of West Germany, this man, a, a very conservative Christian named Alois Hundhammer, writes the preamble of the, uh, the Bavarian Constitution. Uh, and you can see, uh, once again, we have something very similar to Ireland before and West Germany later. God, human dignity, uh, uh, and, and the link to conservative politics is also very strong. He had been in Dachau. He'd been interned as an enemy of the regime. It wasn't because he cared about the Jewish people. It's, it, it may surprise us, but few to no West Germans did at this time. They didn't know or care enough yet. But they did care about what society they would have after their populist mistakes. And it was going to have to be, according to figures like this, a conservative Christian one, as an alternative to populist, a horror. And uh, the, so the story I'd tell, whether we look at uh, Italy uh, or West Germany a few years later, this same pattern holds. Now, uh, Secularism, for its part, the French Revolution, which had first introduced human rights, were now seen to lead to their own kind of horror in the Soviet state and the Soviet uh, experiment. And in fact, the Soviets, of course, claimed to be the rightful heirs of the French Revolution. And so we see a pattern emerge, which is that dignity, having been introduced by the first Christian democratic politician of, of real significance in history, Eamon de Valera in Ireland, becomes like the calling card of Christian democratic constitutions, religious and conservative politics as an alternative to populism. Now, I told you there would be two morals. These are my first old morals, which is that this is a sad story uh, because... Uh, unless you're Christian and conservative, you should worry that these concepts, which are going to go so far in the world, were not invented by the secular progressive left, but by the conservative Christian right. And they had a close association to their politics of moral constraint of human beings for a long time. Uh, now, I'm thinking there might be a saving grace to this conservative Christian politics. Uh, but let's get to that, because there wasn't just the national idea of human dignity, because the idea was internationalized in what we increasingly recognize as a Christian Cold War. Actually, Americans had rarely used the concept of human dignity uh, in the 19th and early 20th century until they uh, followed Catholics in uh, declaring war against Bolshevism a bit later in the late 40s. But we find in American Cold War rhetoric this concept of human dignity uh, in an, a moment when the United States is itself Christianizing in a sense, becoming its own kind of Christian democracy, that the rhetoric of dignity in justification of the Cold War is also quite prominent. Now, that's all long ago. I want to acknowledge that today, what might not have been true about the 40s has become true. You can use dignity without this baggage 
You might embrace it as a central principle for your own politics, right or left. And that's because it's been freed from its original associations. Some of the main events in that history involved law, uh, uh, far more recent constitutions like the South African, which has spread the idea that every constitution were ever written, including places like Iraq today, begin with human dignity. And then there was uh, academic movements like the revival of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, mostly by secular liberals who also have made a great deal of the concept of human dignity. And then there was this larger human rights revolution. Uh, this is my last engram and almost my last slide. For all that I've been saying, while human rights and dignity entered constitutions in the 30s and 40s, no human rights movement and especially no international human rights movement emerged. Even while dignity was the watchword of the right, what was the European left trying to do? Build socialism, expand the state. Even though they'd seen Hitler, and even when they hated Stalin, they wanted socialism redistribution and a larger managerial state. Uh, but for some reason, the left has embraced human rights in our time since approximately the 1970s. And what that means is that different people for different reasons can make different claims on the concept of human dignity. And yet, I wonder if my story has that second moral. Because for some people, like Angela Merkel, the original meaning of human dignity remained strong. She invoked the day after Trump was elected the concept of the dignity of man as the conservative's talisman against populism. And in fact, uh, in France, this man pictured here, François Fillon, has done the same. Uh, it seems as if in France and Germany, once again, we are facing a scary choice. Our choice is not between the secular left and the populist right. It doesn't seem like it, that's the choice that the voters are facing. They're going to choose between a Christian conservative and a fascist. Merkel will struggle to stay in power against alternative for Germany to her right. François Fillon has reawakened Catholic nationalism in France, but as the main alternative to Marine Le Pen and the National Front. Uh, and so it seems like we're back in this era in which dignity might be important because it's once again the line between a more acceptable Christian conservative politics and a fearful populism. And if that's the choice, as much as we might hate that it is, uh, we have to uh, embrace dignity uh, because it seems to be on the right side. Thank you very much. So, comments, questions, criticisms? Yes, sir. Um, I have a, a question which relates to what I perceive as some tendencies in contemporary discourse, maybe in a field like comparative religion, but I don't want to limit it to that, to push back against the notion that, a notion voiced by some people, that um, human rights discourse is a kind of neo-colonial discourse trying to take a Western idea, whether it's a liberal idea or a Christian ideology bracket for the moment, and superimpose it around the world. 
And so sometimes, as a rejoinder to that accusation that human rights discourse is neo-colonial, you'll sometimes hear the rejoinder, ah, let's think not about human rights, but about the notion of dignity, which is then read kind of ex post facto back into history with the argument we can find analogs throughout world religions and across different epics of history, analogs to the notion of human dignity. And I will never think about that sort of rhetorical move to say it again after hearing your talk. What, what are the implications for that kind of rhetorical move? Does that become an illegitimate project of reading the notion of dignity back into history in an utterly inaccurate I think that's a fantastic question. And, and you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I'll give you mine, um, and then we'll see where it goes. So, um, so I just start with the comment that at the time that, that the UN Charter is written and the time the Universal Declaration is drafted and ratified, it, there are 50 odd countries and a full three quarters of them are majority Christian countries. Uh, and then decolonization takes place kind of so very surprisingly and, and certainly against the will of many of the countries originally in the room. And yet from the first, these documents have to be translated and communicated worldwide, um, including into colonial spaces. Um, and so whether or not there were pre-existing concepts or words for dignity, um, there was a mapping procedure. And we know that from various studies of the translation of uh, the Universal Declaration. Now that's not a new process because we have very good scholarship on the vernacularization of of the Western of the of the Western Bible, uh, you know, and how, how it was how it was translated into various um, global languages, you know, under under colonial auspices, um, and and there's no reason not to say that this this was the same in the sense that it was a colonial world. Now it's also the case that, you know, whatever we want to call them, subaltern actors always have room for maneuver. They can propose, uh, you know, that their concepts do or don't match the concepts and words coming at them from above. Um, and that happened uh, from very early on. One of the, you know, draftsmen of the UDHR um, uh, was a, a na uh, f sent by the nationalist Chinese government. Um, you know, he had done a PhD under John Dewey at Columbia, but nonetheless, his role in the proceedings was to say, yes, this matches what we already think. Here's a word that's like dignity, et cetera. Um, and I think we'd have to go back and adjudicate for every one of those um, acts of translation, um, what, what happened? Was it a matter of imposition or was it a matter of subaltern creativity or a little of both? Did it leave it? Did it leave things open for some, you know, continuing politics of, uh, of negotiation? Um, now, I will add that just for Pi as for Pius XII, it does seem that um, if we associate any, you know, content with dignity, that it's more globally acceptable in more places. Um, I may be, you know, in the minority here or the majority, but. I think the idea that individuals have rights against the state has, is progressive and it's very, it, it, it flies in the face of most ethical traditions we know so far, including all prior Western ones, uh, whereas dignity does not. Uh, and so for, whether for good or bad reasons, if you're out there and you want to resist human rights, in a way, as Pius XII did, you can cabin them within an alleg a larger allegiance to dignity, which may have more resonance wherever you are. Um, now, that's an act of power. It's, you know, we can interpret in various ways. Is, is that helpful? The last portion, it's very, very compelling. I think it's, I mean, it's, I want to see the floor to, to, to someone else, but that the possibility that it's a very kind of conscious rhetorical move occurring because it has a greater resonance in post-colonial contexts, doesn't have the aura of neo-coloniality about it that a notion of rights might have. It's very, very compelling. It's fascinating. Thank you.
It, it is, but we might also say, you know, this, this is a case in which the, a resonance is found with, let's say, the, the more conservative origins of human rights against their more liberal appropriation later, um, which, which, you know, we might find troubling. Yes. Well, this is, I guess, just to take up uh, this uh, point of some discussion. And, uh, okay. Uh, and you could have, you, it might be that in one of the slides you, you kind of uh, set this, this thesis out, that yeah. they passed too quickly on to the Cold War. But um, I'm just wondering if dignity um, could be a rear guard initiative to, to stave off uh, secular human, human rights. Uh, by conservative figures, Christian yes. figures, who fundamentally shrank from yes. uh, the, the whole human rights uh, initiative, but who see by, even by the late 1930s, let alone in the 1940s, yes. that there's a, that this tide is advancing. And so, in, in effect, it's a kind of an, an attempt to retain uh, some, some stage. That's right. In the intellectual and moral uh, uh, environment of the day, so to retain some intellectual and moral influence. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very tempting interpretation that, in a way, this. This is a story of the victory of secular liberalism because even its old enemies are forced to take it on board. Uh, the French Revolution, especially for Catholics, had been anathema. And yet Catholic, Catholics in the 1940s end up, end up being some of the you know, central spokesmen. Um, so I want to challenge that tempting thesis because it's, it's very, it's, I think it's right but it has another side because when two things come together, we have to ask which redefine the other, probably a little of both. But the argument would be the whole meaning of human rights change through their encounter with and their subordination to human dignity. So they had been associated previously with the emancipatory wildfire of the French Revolution. Uh, and that had lots of implications for lots of different kinds of people, um, both in Europe and globally. Um, and yet then it seems after World War II, because of the Soviets, as if the French Revolution is dangerous. Uh, and for that matter, uh, if it goes global, it's going to be at the hands of anti-colonial politicians um, who adopt... Uh, it's assertive national, the French Revolution's assertive nationalism, but might turn their back on its human rights. Um, and at this moment, I think Christians don't just see a necessity, but also an opportunity. Uh, they can assert ownership over this. And it, again, it's not as if there's a strong leftist or progressive interpretation of human rights at this time. As I say, the cleavage in European politics is between Christian Democrats and socialists, including in, in the United Kingdom, the Labour Party. Uh, so just as an example of that, the, it's Winston Churchill out of power and the Tories who agitate for this treaty called the European Convention on Human Rights. And for them, it's a way of clamping down on the threat of domestic socialism by tarring it with the brush of, you know, uh, of... of of uh, encroaching communism. Uh, and so there's this strange thing that it's not as if, um, it's not as if this is an uncomplicated victory for liberal secular principle because in a way the Christian right also gets to assert ownership over the principles, define what they mean in domestic settings uh, and, and to the extent there is international uh, human rights politics. Uh, international settings. Just as a last example of that, if we ask what are the first big causes in the UN around human rights that where, where something's called a human rights violation? Well, it's the internment of these two Catholic clerics, the most famous of whom is Cardinal Joseph Mincenti uh, by communist governments. Uh, and to me, that's all very significant. So so I, I totally take your question, and I think you've hit the right answer, but I just want to add this proviso that, um, you know, there might have been 
a redefinition the other way around, with human rights, in a sense, becoming more conservative in their meaning than they had been. And it sounds like the other piece of that story comes to the 1970s, that when the left has, yes, we embrace right. human rights, they do it, it's domestically it's not a political party. So, sure, when you read that back into the 1940s, it sounds like... <coughs> sure. Well, so, I mean, it should be said that at this, I mean, I didn't talk about the details of this moment, but what's going on, and th it's this amazing wave we're surfing that, that really, you know, is based on something happening right around the middle of the 70s. And we know when we look at, like, the first human rights movements kind of understood to be such uh, in places like Poland and Argentina, that they involve coalitions of secular leftists, often Marxists, with, um, you know, concerned um, Catholics. Uh, and there's common ground in these kind of very neutral principles. Now, I would never suggest that in entering those coalitions, somehow the, the secular progressives became religious conservatives. But we can say that this history in which the secular left has redefined itself around human rights, they've given up socialism. So I, can't, I could show you this ingram if you want me to type it up, but one thing we can do with this technology is do comparative salience and look at one word versus another. And if you do the socialism uh, analysis with human rights, it's amazing because it's riding way high in the saddle for most of history. And then in the same year, 1975, it tanks. And the lines cross in 1989. And now, of course, socialism is extremely unpopular, except I understand in this province. Uh, so uh, that's very significant, I think. Uh, so it's not that the right won, but the left was making different choices in the 40s than it did in the 70s uh, and after. Now, this is relevant to, po I'll just continue one thought that's relevant to populism because one thing we debate on, especially in the United States right now, is did the left or the Democrats, as we have in the United States, err by embracing a politics of recognition rather than redistribution? Because what that meant is that it failed to create a transracial majority. Uh, and, uh, of course, the, the, its coalition, which had been based fundamentally on the white working class for back in, back in history, including in the New Deal, has been lost to Donald Trump. So there, there could be a lesson there that if we go too far in the direction of recognition politics without fusing it with redistribution politics, uh, we open ourselves up to populist, uh, populist backlash. Question. Yes. So, do you think that the dignity discourse, and I think in the United States in particular, do you think it allows for um, discrimination against non-Christians more readily than than human rights discourse? Uh, the, I I I don't know of much evidence for that proposition. Um, so I'm only, I'm only giving it this central role, um, even in the United States, at a, at a very specific time, 30s and 40s, because now if you download the platform of the Democrats and the Republicans, you'll see you know, about the same number of uses of dignity, and it's a lot. It's just on totally different issues. So for the Democrats, dignity has to do with women's rights abroad. Uh, and uh, for the Republicans, it has to do with the dignity of the fetus. Uh, so, you know, it ha and, 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 and we have to s acknowledge that since this time in the 40s, dignity has become a central concept in conservative approaches to bioethics, which really was not on the horizon uh, given the technological circumstances in the 40s. I, so I can't say that, um, that dignity, you know, it, 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 it is, is, is playing this invidious role relative to non-Christians. We can say in the larger human rights universe, there has definitely been an American politics of a promotion of religious freedom 
abroad, which um, some have charged is very much um, tilted in the direction of, 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 of protection of Christians abroad. Um, and you see that in various, um, you know, various instances. Now, it's also the case in the Middle East that there have been many episodes to decry, of, you know, fate of Christians in recent years. So it's hard to kind of tease out the politics there. But to the best of my knowledge, dignity is not playing that role. And it didn't in, in, in that year I was speaking about to either, to the best of my knowledge. Well, it's interesting that when, you know, you look at the slogan in Tucker Square, it's almost six years ago today, yes, right? yes. the term karma or dignity, when it was prominent among them, like, like, as opposed to, you know, democracy or something like that, that makes it like, yeah. with all the colorful revolutions, yeah. the way that it was compared. I, so, are we talking about the same thing? Are, so, which is interesting because it's definitely against that illiberal authoritarianism. Right. And maybe, you know, in, those, in that culture at that time, it was also a safe place to be versus sure. secular uh, human rights sure. in the West, etc. Um, do we have, is there a definition of dignity that. So, my, you know, my talk is premised on the idea that we can only know what it means by figuring out who's using it for what project. Now, if you had a philosopher here, there are, there are umpteen theories of dignity. I think minimally we can say that it's the notion that human beings are special in some way from which consequences follow. But then there's a total disagreement about what consequences are. Um, now, I'm not going to, you're the expert. I'm not sure, like, what is gained and lost in saying the, the following Arabic word is the translation of the word dignity. Um, maybe a little, maybe a lot. But then we would have to care about its function in a particular context. Now, if you start out in a place like Egypt on the premise that uh, a democracy that is going to survive, a, you know, the authoritarianism before and after will have to find some compromise between, you know, with religion. Uh, then I think we're on the grounds of the earlier question because it seems as if dignity is something that around which there can be coalitions of the religious and non-religious who agree to fight with one another, but to rule out certain extreme options. Uh, and you know, the interesting thing is that that's the function it originally played in the era I'm talking about. Um, now, is, does it, it has no inherent meaning. I mean, I don't believe any word has an inherent meaning because they're defined by their use. So, but but it, if, if that were to be the case, it would be very interesting because it would be a parallelism across a pretty long period and a pretty big space. Yes. Uh, when well, you suggested you alluded to sanctity as being an older concept with people, yes. so I'm, I'm just wondering why uh, Pius the Eleventh well, picked up on dignity when they, when they were about to yes. seize upon this idea. Yes, for the reasons maybe yes. you alluded to why dignity not. So, so it's not that dignity is radically new. I mean, it's um, it it. It, it is, I mean, even if we look at those charts, we can see that it, these formula I'm talking about were not never used before. Like you can see there's a tiny bit in English in, in you know, we'd have to look at the percentages because I just did a snip of this, but it's not as if it was never used. Um, so I'm talking about like a, a, a rise in its prominence, but not ex nihilo. Uh, so there, I'm not making the claim that that sanctity would have been used, you know, by the Pope or that, you know, that was that this, 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 this always, you know, that the dignity had never existed. Um, I guess, you know, again, sanctity is just another word. Um, one could argue that sanctity seems to have a more definitely religious meaning than dignity. Um, and yet it's these religious actors who are the ones who seem to be determining the fact that we don't have sanctity in these central international documents. Um, I don't have a good, you know, I can only go so far as the evidence take, takes me. And I can, you know, I, I looked hard at 
Virginia Gildersleeve to try to understand why she did what she did. As for Pius XI, um, there's probably more research to be done into what his sources were, uh, because it's surely not accidental that he wrote that encyclical in March 1937 against communism and said the central error of communism is its disrespect for dignity. So then, in a way, I've just you know, begged the question or pushed the analysis one step back. And fair enough, um, I just respond that I'm, you know, my story is really turning on not the invention, but in the rise in, in use for a particular purpose in politics of this word. Yes? Is there any indication that there is a term or a concept similar to dignity in um, contemporary populist influence? It, you, I think there is. Uh, you know, there, there, there. Again, just as the the people further left than you know, religious conservatives can claim dignity, so can those further right. However, in what I've seen, they tend when I mean, it's not common that they use it. They never refer to individual dignity, which is what we're talking about. Um, if we look back in history, the, the word dignity all by itself has been on decline ever since the Middle Ages, um, used less and less. And it, and, you know, it, it refers to different objects over that time. Um, so uh, in, in when, I, when I have seen populists use the term dignity, it's the dignity of the nation or the people. Uh, or of the, you know, of the downtrodden uh, white working class in the United States. So it's a more collectivist dignity that's being re redeemed. Um, and what was, I think, in a sense, noble about these Catholics is that where they wanted to draw the line in the end was with excessive identification with the nation. Long before Make America Great Again, they had seen Make Germany Great Again. Uh, and they flirted with, with that slogan uh, because it seemed to serve Catholic interests. Uh, and, and actually, Protestants were much more Nazified as a general matter than Catholics, so that should be said. Um, but in the end, they said individuals have rights from God that, that aren't exhausted by their identification with the nation. So this is a long-winded answer, but... Um, I haven't seen much, and to the extent I've seen it, it hasn't been about human dignity. It's been about the dignity of Hungarians in Viktor Orban's case or whatever. I mean, I would just yeah. throw out if there, if there is a populist equivalent in communism of the day, yeah. I would say it's the forgotten man. Oh, yeah. The forgotten man, sure. I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, we're just at the beginning of these theories of... Um, Populism, and I'm just using it in a very, you know, vanilla way. But we need more work on that. Um, I, I would say I'll be surprised if human dignity figures in the lexicon of populists. Dignity of other things might. Yeah. I have uh, two questions in okay. your witnesses, which you are, which you have presented for okay. this uh, word dignity. The okay. first person is Pius XII. Yes. And the whole pontifex. Yes. I mean, Pius XII has made a contract with Hitler to uh, yes. deal with yes. the, the Hitler regime. For sure. And I think it has a certain uh, content. If anybody like this is talking about dignity, and the pontifex has yes. even after the war yes. uh, helped Nazi people to disappear to South America. For sure. I mean, what does this mean? Does this, does this mean uh, dignity out of this? When people like this are talking about this. The second thing is that uh, the Vichy regime has helped to, to uh, bring Jewish people to the, to the Nazi. Yes. And what does it mean? Yes. You are talking about dignity from this. Period. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, uh, it 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 is it is it is surprising, but 
it turns out that from these people, the concept of dignity entered world politics. That's not my fault. Uh, it's, it's shocking because we can't understand. I, for me, this is only a, a problem, you know, if yes. on one hand there's yes. dignity, on the other hand there's a hassle. Well, you know, we, we all, so we always judge retrospectively in, 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 on the basis of a moral sense that's been constructed often since the time uh, of the people we're judging. Uh, now, I'm not going to suggest that it wasn't very possible to condemn Pius XII for his silence or Vichy for its, you know, for its murderous uh, connivance with the Germans at the time. But it was very hard to do so in the name of dignity because they were talking about it. Uh, in fact, they introduced it to world politics. So this is my point. Uh, in, so if we take that 1942 Christmas message with which I started, it's been read many times lately, uh, mainly to try to understand uh, why he didn't mention the Jews. Uh, he didn't mention what was happening to them. What if he had, et cetera. Uh, and yet this is, there's this strange thing that he offers these peace points. And his first one is the linear source of the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration's consecration of dignity. So these are both true. Uh, and I'm a historian of, let's say, what we say we're for, uh, because it's not as if, you know, we don't have to figure out where that came from. I hope that's clear. I, 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 I condemn uh, these uh, guys, you know, as much as you do. But then the question is, in the name of what? Some people condemn them in the name of, you know, um, you know, communism, the bit, you know, the, 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 those who loomed largest in the French resistance against Vichy were communists. They weren't talking about human dignity. It was the constitution of Vichy that was the first that introduced human dignity. So we, we ponder that, I think. Now, again, I think we can use dignity however we want. Just because Vichy invented it doesn't mean we have to use it the same way. I don't think I can use dignity as well. <laughs> well, no, I it all. I think, I mean, the lesson of the talk is you can use words however you like, but you should be very clear about it in your own mind and make sure you're, you're not, uh, you know, taking on board someone else's baggage in doing so. <laughs> Could you speak a bit about the relationship between uh, self-determination and anti-clinical movements and the dignity term in discourses of uh, rights or of some kind of human dignity beyond the nation or yes. empire? Yes. It appears to be that perhaps you're suggesting they're not um, related in any causal sense. Uh, although, as you did allude to, um, during the Algerian uh, war of resistance, yeah. Because the United Nations have been in existence and there were ways to refer to human rights violations, both sides, of course, did do that. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious about the role of dignity references yes. in that history. It's a great question, but I, I haven't done enough research to speak s surely. I'll just speculate. Because what we would have to do is go look at, um, you know, the degree to which um, anti-colonial actors invoke dignity for various purposes. I think it's the case that um, some, you know, who were influenced by Christian social thought, um, like Leopold Senghor, um, were, would be very likely to invoke human dignity because dignity became the subject of lots of Christian, you know, theory um, of various kinds. Um, it might be that, you know, in an older tradition, anti-colonialists invoke the dignity of the nation because Beyond this very basic meanings that humans are special, um, often people say that there's the meaning of dignity is that you can't be humiliated. 
Um, now that's one meaning that some people associate with it. And if that's the case, then maybe we find anti-colonial actors using it. I myself think that this chart um, shows that human rights and, 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 and kind of by, by necessity that um, the notion of human dignity along with it reached their real period of popularity after decolonization. And I've interpreted that in the following way. Um, uh, even though Adolf Hitler and Philippe Pétain, et cetera, had come, um, nationalism was not uh, made illegitimate by their actions. In fact, it was given a new strength. After World War II, if you had seen the Holocaust, unless you integrated as a Jew in, in, in a Western nation, you wanted a new nation for Jews. Uh, and there's so many other examples. Um, decolonization is, you know, among whatever else it is, a nationalist movement. I've interpreted the rise of human dignity and human rights in our time, at least as in part, as, a, as the death knell of that anti-colonial nationalism. And here I would give a, a, you know, a somewhat sinister reading that... Um, when, when Westerners began, these, this is English. I mean, we find the same in all the languages we're able to test, same curve. But they're all North Atlantic languages to date. Um, and uh, they all show this, this rallying around human rights after the 70s. And I've just interpreted that in the following way. Um, it was thought for a long time from the American Revolution on that national emancipation could work together with human rights. Um, that if you wanted individual protection, you had to adopt a politics of national emancipation, violent if necessary, until decolonization when that equation no longer seemed to hold. Uh, uh, and it became necessary to set up international supervision of human rights. Now we could ask, why was it that when my country had its nationalist revolution in 1776 and exiled 30,000 you know, dissenters, no international human rights regime was set up. Why in 1789, when on the basis of human rights and national emancipation took place with a great deal of violence, no international regime was set up. It didn't really even happen after World War II except on paper. Well, I, I believe it's because anti-colonial nationalism is, uh, you know, it is, was regarded as very dubious by those in the global north who didn't think the new nations were up to the challenge of protecting individuals and needed some superordinate structure. I mean, that's the interpretation I've advanced in my works. But it could be that, again, and we find that there are anti-colonial actors and post-colonial actors who are creative in the way that they take these concepts and mobilize them in their own ways. I just don't have the evidence to know either way. Yes? <laughs> I can't help seeing the, the synchronicity with the decline of the welfare state, yes. the growing inequities. Yes. But, I mean, I think that's how Joseph Stiglitz would yeah. Yeah. interpret this. No, uh, I, I've said, so I said that in a different way by, by claiming that human rights are the death knell of socialism. Uh, and so you might put it this way. We substituted um, local and exclusionary but powerful and expensive solidarity with deterritorialized, weak and cheap solidarity. Uh, now, is that good or bad? Well, good in the sense that our solidarity should be universal. Bad in the sense that it's weak and cheap. So if we had a, a response to this graph, I would say it would need to be to retrieve the strong 
and expensive solidarity of the welfare state and scale it up. Uh, but you know that's not what's happening. So that's how I'm driven to find new hope in the Christian right. Uh, who's going to withstand Donald Trump? It's not me. Uh, it's the Christian right that first didn't lend its support to Trump and are now finding him useful. Same in France, same in Germany, et cetera. But maybe that's too pessimistic. Yes. Today I read in the news that um, one of Mr. Trump's uh, advisors accused the New York Times in an interview of the press and for being, you know, whatever negative things you can imagine. Yes. But in addition, he said that you are therefore humiliated. And that concept stuck with me because now yes. the press is being robbed of its dignity. Uh, just follow on your definition. It's a, um, you know, it's, it's a fascinating development. You know, e e many of us have tended to think of a, a politics of decency and non-humiliation as, as something that is, you know, should provide a minimum um, in social affairs. But then, you know, it seems as if it also is a recipe for the aggrieved uh, to claim that others have slighted them. You know, because Trump himself, it seems like his greatest fear is, is humiliation. And so, you know, a politics in which we're oriented towards humiliation, it seems, is, 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 has its own dark side. Uh, so I don't know what else to say, but it, we have to watch that in the coming months. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>